you want to talk a little bit about what being a story consultant and a story artist is? Yeah, well, I, I, for some people out there, maybe know that storyboarding is one of the first things that happens on a feature film or a TV show or even a commercial. So we basically work very closely with the writer and the director, and we basically are the first people that visualize what it's going to be. So I get script pages or any story person would get script pages and we basically act like a camera person. That's basically what you do. And you think about what the scene would look like with the camera, with editing and different shots. And so I spend a lot of time, if you're on a movie, you're on it for maybe a several years. If you're on a TV show, it's probably a lot shorter. If you're on a commercial, it's even shorter. Um, as a story consultant, it's a little different. I haven't done a lot of that, but a lot of what I did at Pixar, we would have screenings of our movies and then spend a week or two sitting in a room with all the story people and the directors and basically just talking about all the problems that the movie had and trying to come up with better ideas. I just did some consulting for a Crip Camp. I don't know if anyone has seen that on Netflix and that was entirely different. I basically looked at a cut of their movie, thought about it, and then we all sat in a room for a couple of days just talking about how we could alter what the movie um, Great. Do you want to talk a little bit about like what made you want to be a storyboard artist or what were you doing, you know, where'd you grow up and before, you know, before your career started? Yeah, your, your uh, this is not at all what I thought I would be doing. <laughs> uh, I was drawing ever since I was a kid, ever since I can remember, I just drew all the time on my homework, outside of school, in school. Uh, but luckily I went to a great art school called California Institute of the Arts or Cal Arts. And I learned what it took to make an animated product, whether it was a TV show or a commercial or a movie. And that allowed me to get work. And so basically when I finished school, I moved to San Francisco and a classmate of mine was working on The Nightmare Before Christmas. So that was my very first job, very lucky. And uh, like anything, I got my foot in the door and I worked on my first film. That's when I became hooked. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to make movies. But I did animation. I did hand-drawn 2D animation for about three or four years. I thought that was going to be my career. Um, but Pixar put out Toy Story and they needed people. And I really wanted to try my hand at some storyboarding. So I applied and got hired for A Bug's Life. And then I basically did that for 22 years, storyboarding. Again, that was a, it's a circuit, you know, sort of a windy path to get there, but um, I ended up loving it. What are some of the favorite projects that you've worked on? I've, I think Bugs Life, because it was my first movie, and I loved all the people I've worked with. Um, I think Monsters, because that's where I met my wife. Uh, I, I loved working on that, but I loved working on Finding Nemo. Uh, Wally are two of my favorite films I've worked on. Um, I loved working on Coco. That was a great experience. Brave, because I loved working with Brenda Chapman. Um, so much of it is who you're working with or what the product, the final product is. Uh, I had never worked with Brad Bird until I got to work on Incredibles 2, just for like two months, but I remember that because he was so much fun to be around. Uh, but Nightmare Before Christmas, Brie Pixar is probably my favorite just because it was the first thing I worked on, but it's also stop motion and it's that's something I love dearly as a medium. And you left Pixar about a year ago, so what I have did. you been doing yeah. since? I had basically become freelance. I built a home office in our detached garage and I basically have worked on a movie called Toy Maker Secret that was based in London. So I learned how to work remotely, which I really enjoyed. I worked on a, a live action film, which I'm looking forward to doing more of. That's exactly what I'm doing now is working on another live action movie, basically storyboarding, which is the same thing, but a little different because it's they need different things for live action as opposed to animation. Uh, working on a film for a company in Cape Town, South Africa, sort of remotely. Um, and then I did some consulting on Crip Camp. So it, I do a lot of these small jobs. Some last longer, some are smaller. Uh, but I like the variety. I love the variety of work. Awesome. Uh, like, how do you, like, always stay, like, up to date with drawing? Are you just drawing all the time? Mm. Or are you, like... Yeah, it depends. I mean, I am drawing all the time. Otherwise, I'm either watching movies, trying to stay up to date. I listen to a lot of director commentary. Um, I don't do a lot of drawing outside of work because I do so much of it for work <laughs> that I, I kind of get a little worn out from doing it, but I try to kind of keep up with my own sketching or life drawing or I work, do projects with my son where we're drawing together. Um, yeah, I, I created a series of talks at Pixar, which I like to do on the side if I can at other colleges or sometimes I get to travel with that. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah. Um. 
So I've got a few other questions, but you guys can chat in your questions or unmute yourself as well, um, just so we can get keep going. Um, so when you talk about watching movies, like when you're watching a movie, do you ever get the opportunity to just enjoy the movie? Or are you always looking at it from a like a filmmaker's point of view? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I am not someone that could watch something and then immediately see the problems or or any of that stuff. I have to watch something just to enjoy it, just to get a sense of what it is. And then I might go back and watch it again a second time if I'm trying to break it down with like a story structure. But I'm always watching for shots because that's what I do with storyboarding. You're trying to create interesting dynamic shots when you're drawing, uh, again, acting like a camera person. So things will always stick out that I remember, like, oh, I remember that. That's a beautiful shot. So hopefully I can buy this and then grab that shot and keep it in my library of images to use for reference. Um, Sometimes I'll watch something I, and I don't like it because of certain things and I know why story-wise why it doesn't quite work. But that's, yeah, it's tricky because I love to watch movies all the time, but I don't want to analyze them <laughs> every time. Um, it said, what's been your favorite per project you've worked on? Yeah, that, well, I, I'd have to say Nightmare Before Christmas was probably one of my favorite things to work on because it was stop motion. They ba literally build sets that are huge even though the puppets are this big but there's like 20 sets so you can walk in this building and it was quite cavernous it was my first job so there was a lot of excitement about that um but the film that really inspired me to want to get into animation is called vincent and if anybody has ever seen that or wants to see it it's from 1982 it's black and white and it's a wonderful stop motion short that tim burton did and i had never seen anything like it i saw it in high school and it blew my mind so the fact that I got to work on a Tim Burton film for my first job is pretty, pretty exciting. Um, I'd have to say that, but I, again, I think Wally and Finding Nemo are two of my favorite Pixar films, I think, in terms of the, the job itself and then the, what, what the movie became. Yeah. Ah, and those happen to be directed by your older brother. Written and directed by my older brother. So I have worked on four movies with my older brother. Um, actually, one post Pixar, he had a live action film that I did some storyboarding on. So. We work really well together. Some people, some brothers don't, but. Um, Regina, hi, Regina. Um, she was like, can we see some examples? Did you bring any, or you'd have to go out? To oh, I'd have to go out and get some examples. Um, maybe I can run out yes. later. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't realize I was doing <laughs> the show and tell. Um, did you do some of the storyboards for Toy Story because it's my favorite Pixar movie and what was it like? Okay, uh, the very, if you're asking about the very first Toy Story, I did not work on that because I was not working at Pixar. So basically, I was working at a company called Colossal Pictures, which I also really enjoyed working at. This was a basically a commercial house. There aren't too many of those around, but they did a lot of hand-drawn animation. They were based in San Francisco, and I loved working there. So I worked there off and on for like two years, loved it. But Toy Story came out in 1995 and did very well, as you know. And so they had other movies already sort of in development. And so Bugs Life was the one they chose to do, but they needed to hire more people. So I basically was part of the hiring wave for that movie. Uh, I did work on Toy Story 2. That was a radically different experience because they ended up removing the directors. We lost all this time and they redid the entire movie in less than a year. I can't remember if you were there for that. I was hired for Monsters. That's right. So was, like, I came in right when that happened. Yeah, it was madness. So that was a whole different experience, but I did enjoy being part of helping that movie get made, fixed and remade, basically. Yeah. Did you work on three and four? I did not work on three, I did not work on four, no. Because Pixar, they, to put a movie out every year, they have at least five movies happening all at the same time. So you can't, it's impossible to work on all of them. Um, Irene, hi Irene. How long is the storyboard process in a feature length film? <laughs> Basically, how long do you have to wait to see your contribution on the screen? Well, it's a, a good question. question. So it takes anywhere from five to six years, just about to yeah. make a Pixar movie from start to finish. It's a long time. Uh, so Too long. yeah, it's very long. <laughs> So the storyboarding process is about three years of that. So basically during those three years, you're basically doing different versions of the movie. So you're storyboarding the whole movie, everyone watches it in the theater, and then you get all these notes, and then you tear it apart, and then you reboard the movie, and then you watch it again, and then ideally you're tearing it apart less and less and less. So by screening number five or six, you know what the movie is, there's sequences that are playing really well, 
and then you're going into production. But the beginning is the funnest because anything is possible. And it's often the, I find the ideas that are the little more interesting uh, th that you get to try kind of knowing, well, we're probably not going to make this version of the movie, but that's how Pixar does it. Not everyone does that. Um, yeah. I mean, in the days when we were both working at Pixar, you, we hand numbered all the boards. And I think at um, either Finding Nemo, there was over 60 or 70,000 hand drawn boards. Yeah. A little yeah. bit less actually. Yeah. Um, but some of them are up to 80,000 yeah. individual drawings before yeah. they even go into production. And then there's all the drawings that aren't numbered at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so what character or scene do you like drawing the most? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I, after doing it for 22 years, I can kind of bore to anything. Uh, I like doing some acting. It's kind of nice to do sort of emotional scenes because those can be really tricky and much more difficult than you think. Action scenes are also really fun. Um, I really enjoyed Nemo because you had to pay attention to all the dimensions because sometimes the camera would be under the fish and you have to watch out what's above them. Uh, and also those guys were easy to draw. So <laughs> that also makes the process flow a little bit faster. I, I really liked the action in that movie. Um, I got to storyboard the angler fish sequence. So when they went down in the deep dark, and so that was exciting to sort of figure out how to represent that on paper. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is another great question. <laughs> um, so what tools do you need? Do you just draw on pen and paper? Is there soft storyboard software? Okay, this is a good question. Um, I am one of the dinosaurs that still works on paper. Uh, I highly recommend paper because you're not lured by the bells and whistles of Photoshop or whatever program you're using because it's all about what the shot structure is and then you can make the drawings pretty if you need to make them pretty. So I always do a first pass on paper, always, just so I can figure out what it's gonna be. And then sometimes I rough it out on paper and that's what I show the director. I just did that last week for the movie that I'm working on because I can do it much quicker. And then I'm also just trying to represent, again, what the shot structure is going to be. And then I can go in and make the drawings look pretty but I just do everything in Photoshop. I have never really worked in any other uh, program. I probably will at some point, but that's a, it's an easy program. Everyone uses it. Uh, there's tools within Photoshop that make it easy to storyboard. Um, but, but I have templates that I do all my thumbnails on. I, I print them out and use pen. It just, that's what I like. I have a, an old school drafting table in my office and, and I love working that way. We would do this there, so we have no internet connection in your office. Yes, it's really, yeah, but I can send <laughs> Old pictures. School, but, I'll go. but I can run out and grab some examples yeah. and show you guys. Yeah. Um, Miriam, you said you have a question. Yeah, you can just speak out if you want. Just uh, Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, the question is, hi, everyone. Um, did this ever happen that you have worked on a particular um, storyboard and then they asked you to, to oh. redo everything from scratch? in the process like did, uh, did disney ever ask you to do redo of every scene or, or yeah are you asking transit to redo everything? yeah are you asking if we have to redo things or, or throw yeah, them yeah, out yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yes yeah, yeah basically the, every single movie that i've worked on yeah every single movie i've worked on the very first version of the movie is you know that's not what's going to be the movie um that is just, it's a very iterative process. You're doing multiple versions to get, we often talked about, okay, we have to get all the bad stuff out to get to the good stuff that everyone that, that you guys see in the theater, uh, you know, when, when it's done. So yeah, we, it, it, that was very difficult for me to learn storyboarding. I realized, oh, it's not my work that they're unhappy with. It's just the story that they're unhappy with. So you just have to storyboard, try different versions of the movie. That's not always the case. Um, Wally, we spent about three months really working at the first act of that movie. That's basically the beginning until Wally gets onto the spaceship and it shoots off into space. That pretty much stayed the same. It, it altered a little bit, but okay. um, the the first act of the first act changed once they finished boarding. I mean, the second, third. Remember, they weren't even speaking English in the well. But in the first act, yeah. it's just on Earth. Yeah. So that's a good example of something that didn't change a lot. But I have other movies that I've worked on where. Here's a good example. Okay, Coco. I loved working on Coco. And I worked on that movie for two and a half, <clears throat> close to three years. And yeah. I'd say maybe a minute of the work that I did is in that movie. That, that's being a story person. So all the work that I did for three years, none of it made it into the movie, except for one scene. <laughs> 
But I also worked on Finding Nemo, and I had like five sequences that were pretty much exactly the way that I storyboarded ended up in the movie. So that's a good example of like how different your experience can be depending on who the director is, how many notes you're getting, whether it changes all the time. I worked on Ratatouille, which was pretty, fairly problematic because the first director just didn't work out. So I worked on that for a year and they just, they threw everything away and, and started from scratch. That's pretty normal. So anytime anybody wants to do a story, I always tell them, just be prepared that half the work, at least that you do, no one's gonna see. <laughs> um, I kind of liken it to a pyramid, actually. You're, what you're doing is laying the foundation, all those different levels of the pyramid, and ideally by the top, that's the version of the movie that everyone gets to see. So often what you're doing is just laying the foundation. No one's gonna see it, but you've helped get to that version of the movie. Um, yeah, the foundation. Yeah. So it can be kind of frustrating. Yeah, it is like for the writers, when we write, we have to like, we rewrite the, revise it, and the original is not the same when it's revised. So these movies that you worked on are one of my favorite ones. So great. I'm really a big fan of these okay. movies. Yeah, thank you for answering. Of course, yes. Um, I mean, I always say, you know, when people want to, you know, especially with a lot of the folks that we work with when we're training filmmakers, I'm like, you got to have the toughest skin in this business because you can't yes. take it personally. Yeah. That, and I think artists always get this sort of weird reputation of being very sensitive. And yes, they're sensitive, but certainly mm -hmm. they can take criticism like nobody I've ever seen. I mean, when we work together in, I, in both the story and the art department, you know, all of their hard work would just be on the floor and it was never personal. It was no. never that their artwork wasn't what that was liked. It was just the fact that it didn't make the story the way that it yeah. needed to be. And you know, if you don't have a thick skin, that could be really hard. That can be really tricky. And also just in the room, that's one of the hardest things that I didn't realize is that you have to work with a group. If you're sitting around a table, throwing ideas out. If you have an idea that you feel very strongly about, you can keep on pushing, but then you kind of have to learn like, okay, this idea is not, does not seem interesting to everybody else. I just have to set it aside. But I would see lots of experiences, or I had a lot of experiences with other people where they just, they kept on pushing and then the director would get angry and go, okay, this isn't helpful. We need to move on. So you, you, you kind of learn like, okay, this is, this is how you work within a room and try to push an idea and step back and set it aside. Because that very idea that doesn't work may come back literally a year later. Like, remember that idea we had a year ago? Yeah, now it fits into the, story structure of the movie now. That happens a lot. Great, all right, next question. If you're not already in the business, but there's a project in development you really wanna work on, do you have any advice for how to contact the studio to get on the project? Oh, hi, Riley, thanks for Riley. Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, in my experience at Pixar, the best way to get into the studio was to get into the internship. Uh, I found that if you were in the internship and you did well, they would often hire people from those internships uh, because it's like a boot camp for whatever department that you want to get into. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of hard, right? You just have to apply and hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would put through the real stories lens. I think that is sometimes easier if you're not a marginalized folk, right. you know, um, because often it is who you know. But I think that there is a lot to set, be said for tenacity, mm -hmm. um, like applying over and over again, talking to folks, right. trying to just see, you know, utilizing a platform like LinkedIn or social media mm -hmm. to see who you might know that's there. Absolutely, um, right. You know, I mean, you got into Pixar because or you got into um, uh, Nightmare for Christmas because of somebody you went to college with. It was a and, classmate, yeah, and then, and then it was a teacher. Yeah, uh, professor. Like Pixar, yeah. Um, so I think like we have so many opportunities to feel figure out how we're connected. Um, and just often I would say women sometimes shy away from those sort of networking opportunities and just to see like, oh, who do I know that might know somebody there? Just even for an informational interview, people often really love talking about what they do or where right. they work. And if you're like, can I buy you a cup of coffee or can I spend 10, 15 minutes and you don't waste their time and just say like, this is something I'm really, really interested in. Do you have any advice? But I think it's also being prepared, making sure that you're willing to do whatever job is initially offered to you, but also making sure that that's also got a trajectory that you want. So it's kind of trying to weigh things out. It's tricky, um, right? Yeah, because you may end up getting into a place that you want to work at, but you might not do what you want to do. And it just may take you a while to get into that, that role. Yeah. Uh, 
email is an amazing thing. I often found as a filmmaker when I was at Pixar, I would just email people cold like, hey, I loved your thing. And then they would write back. I'd be like, oh my God, they actually wrote me back. So you just, you just never know. Um, but it is tenacity, right? Yeah. It's often being at the right place at the right time. Yeah, um, figuring out who you might know that works on Yes, that, so. yeah. Um, so Le from Lennon, what was one of the hardest parts in doing storyboards? Yeah, I think the hardest part, it, it took a while to learn, oh, they're gonna just, we're gonna toss whole versions of this movie over and over again until we find the right version. I think going through all those storyboarding multiple versions of the movie and having it all thrown away is very frustrating. Um, I think also there may be a version of the movie that you really liked and that they're gonna just keep moving on and try different versions. So that, that happened a lot. There were other versions that I thought would be just as good as what ended up going out into the world. Um, it can be tricky with who you're working with. Uh, I think once I kind of got the hang of storyboarding, it wasn't so much that, it was, it was who the director was and whether they were open to ideas or whether they could give you direction. If the director can't really direct, that can be very frustrating as a story person because you realize, oh, we're just spinning our wheels and something's gonna give, whether the director's gonna get removed or Lord knows what. Um, but that, yeah, I would think, I mean, I, sometimes just doing cleanup, I don't love that. I like roughing out sequences. I like pitching, but then if I could just hand that off to someone else, that, <laughs> I'd be really happy, but that's not really part of the, the process. I don't know if that answers that question. But. Um. I think this is Miriam's question that yes. she asked already. But um, so, how many storyboarders work on a feature-length film, and how much screen mm -hmm. time does any one boarder contribute? Oh, that's a really good question. So at Pixar, and I think like most studios, it's anywhere from six to ten people that would be on a team, and they break the script down into sequences. So there's anywhere from forty to fifty sequences. So as you can imagine, you're not getting to do a lot, but if you do a good job, or you happen to be if you stick with the, the movie for a couple of years, what you're gonna do is gonna end up on the screen. But if you're on a, a movie earlier, as I mentioned with Coco, I was on that movie for two and a half years, you know, maybe a minute of what I did ended up in the movie. But if you get onto a movie later, sort of like midstream, then the chances of you having work that's gonna end up on the screen will be, will be much higher. Uh, so it's tricky, you know, you, you might get a sequence I, I have some friends that would keep, they would keep on getting the same sequence, like, can you reboard this? And then you kind of go a little crazy because you can only reboard something so many times. That can be a little infuriating. And like, what's the range of the team size? Like, Yeah, anywhere from six to 10 people is what I found. Obviously smaller is a little better because your contribution is, is bigger. Uh, so anytime the team gets that big, you're getting smaller chunks and sections and that, that can be frustrating. Um, and I think this is a good like follow-up question. So you basically do the brainstorming. So like that's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the beginning, in the early years of Pixar, we didn't always have scripts, right? We didn't always have full scripts. So that was kind of fun because you'd be in the room trying to helping the director and the writer as a group formulate what the film was going to be. That's very exciting because your ideas can sometimes get picked up and end up in the script. Uh, and then there's a lot of brainstorming after the screening. So if you put the movie up. Everyone watches it, lots of notes. Ideally, you have like a week at least, if not two, where you're just in a conference room hashing out ideas and trying to pick apart the movie and, and look at what's really broken to try to fix it. That's where a lot of the brainstorming happens, yeah, in my opinion, yeah. But you also do, I mean, some character <clears throat> design and development. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, like there's, I mean, you work closely with both the art department yeah. and the editorial department. Yeah, sometimes what happens often is story is starting and then the art department sort of formulates and starts feeding the story department work. Yeah. And then the story department watches the real, I mean, the art department watches the reels and then they get informed like, ah, okay, this is what's in the movie. So now they know what they have to design and recreate and characters. And then those two departments are sort of feeding each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes we actually have meetings together, which is really fun. We get to do some brainstorming with different people. Yeah. Cool. Um, so how much is board driven versus script driven at Pixar these days? Do you do much story development? I, I, ideation, do you know, do you do now as a story <coughs> artist? Um, yeah, the, the, the back half of my career at Pixar, I'd say the last 10 years, they became more script driven. And so they would really work on these scripts and development and they wouldn't really bring a story team on until they had a, a script. That does not mean at all that that is the movie that was being made. You would basically storyboard the whole movie with that version of the script. 
but then they would still tear it apart. So you're still ideally helping with the restructuring of the film and the story structure and, and, and all of that. Um, in the early days, it wasn't. So now it is more script driven. But what happens is as the film gets boarded multiple times, it's almost like the reels become the movie and not the script. And so the script is just being updated according to the reels. Uh, if that makes sense. So the, so the movie itself starts to kind of tell you what it needs to be, ideally. Great. Um, so resources. So uh, what are your resources focus on script or storyboard? I mean, you have a book there or do you have resources that you like? Do you want to talk about like what you kind of... Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I cannot emphasize enough. If you really want to get into feature film storyboarding, you kind of have to know your film language. Um, everyone watches movies, everyone watches TV shows, but there's a language of film within these studios and you have to know what they're asking for, whether it's an extreme close-up or an over the shoulder or what's an extreme wide or and any of that kind of stuff, uh, which took me a while to learn. So I, my resources are watching tons of movies. I, I try to watch as many as I can. I, I always recommend if people are learning to find a movie that you like that has director commentary, that's almost like film school in a box. It's amazing. And you can learn so much just by hearing the director talk about their process. Not every commentary is gonna have that, but there are several directors that I like that I always listen to their commentary because it's incredibly informative about their decision-making behind each scene. Um, even just watching your favorite scene in a movie, you can break it down yourself, figure out how is this scene edited? How is it put together? What's the staging? and the composition like. I don't do a lot of reading because I don't have a lot of time for that, but I, I can recommend anybody who hasn't, hasn't read this book. This is a great starter. Uh, it's by Bruce Block. And it's a very, it's a good book to kind of get to have because it breaks things down really well. I'm going to put it in the chat too. Oh, yeah. Block. And then what's it called? The Visual Storytelling? It's called, yeah. This is, there's so many like this, but this is a good one. Um, again, I like to hear from the filmmakers themselves honestly, when I can. I don't know if, that, if that's, that helps. I mean, I love art, different artists and I look at different things to inspire me. Um, oh, this is not a question, but it's from Riley. Not, um, but I just wanted to say that when I was really sick in the hospital when I was two, I watched Bugs Life a lot. My parents survived because of Bugs Life. Hey, yeah. wow. Yeah, no, I, that, that movie was, for me, was like, can I do this? Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I had to learn how to do it on the fly. And, and but many of the ideas that I pitched sort of many kind of made it into the back half of the movie. And, but that's, that's where I learned how to do everything I do. Uh, but I was terrified. <laughs> but what are some of the films that you watch that you have like a personal connection to in that same way? Like, do you have films that you, like they have gotten you through tough times or? Yeah, or me like films that I grew up with. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I had a father who loved movies, so that's what we did. We went out to see movies all the time. Um, I have fond memories of seeing Star Wars, of course. I was part of that generation. I was seven years old when that came out. Um, Close Encounters of the First Kind is something that I con consistently go back to. Like, that was kind of a mind-blowing thing to see at seven. I'd say a movie that really stuck with me was Time Bandits. Has anybody seen Time Bandits? I had never seen anything like that and it was like probably the darkest movie I had ever seen but it's it's insanely inventive and creative and, and that I love that movie so that's that's a touchstone for me I saw things like Black Stallion that I remember but I would also see sort of inappropriate things I saw Jaws at a very young age which is probably not so great but I love horror movies now that maybe had a part of it um, I had never seen anything quite like Invasion of the Body Snatchers the 1978 version which terrified me but I had never heard heard a movie like this. And then the sound designer that worked on that movie, Ben Burt, worked on Wally. -E. So it was amazing to see that movie at eight, terrify me, and then meet Ben Burt and be able to talk to him about like, how did you make the sounds in that movie? Um, animated films, I grew up seeing all the Disney movies, but I, I liked Secret of Nim, which is not Disney, it's a Bluth film. Um, if you're asking about animation, I've never seen, I, I, I love that. But again, Vincent. The short Vincent is what really stuck with me. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, story, Star Wars. In Star Wars, Lucas had a vague ideas and his artist storyboarders brought home, <laughs> brought those characters to life. Your personal favorite vague concept you personally felt you helped bring to life. Oh, yeah, boy. I don't know if I, I mean, there were a lot of 
a lot of really cool ideas in Coco that we worked on two different versions of that movie. And the very first one, uh, we took a lot of vague concepts and, and brought that to life. That is not what the version you guys saw, um, unfortunately. But um, I mean, again, A Bug's Life was, we, I felt like we were just like winging it on that movie. We didn't, there was no end. We didn't have an end to that movie for at least two years. So that was sort of like, how do we end this movie? So there was always that was like hanging over our heads and- Monsters seem real vague. Yeah, real well, monsters was, yeah, you're right. Monsters <laughs> was quite vague. Uh, so it, it, there are a few of those where it was sort of like, I think when I worked, I did a little bit of development time with Pete Doctor when he was just developing up. So that was actually really fun. Those were just, it was just like the vaguest of ideas about what that movie could be. And I, I had a lot of fun helping do a bunch of beat boards to sort of like pitch that version of the movie. Yeah, I don't know if that answers that. Um, if we don't answer those questions, <laughs> you're welcome to unmute and say, no, I actually had a follow up uh, question yes. as well. So, or just re-chat. <laughs> um, so how much time do you usually take to storyboard a movie version? Yeah, it, again, it takes about three years at Pixar because we're doing multiple versions of the movie. Not many other studios do that. I think they would probably, maybe would be more like two years to, to really put a decent version of the movie out. Because you want to do at least two before you start going into production. Um, Pixar just, they have the time and the money to extend that period quite a bit. Um, yeah. And I mean, and I think in live action, it's you sometimes you only have a few months. It's totally different with live action. Like right now, I'm just basically boarding out uh, the version of the movie that I have. And hopefully what I'm storyboarding will be used when they shoot the movie. That's what you hope. Um, all right, I have an idea for story. Do we pitch directly to Pixar? Or do we have to go through an agent or something? What do you suggest? Well, Pixar, unfortunately, doesn't take outside Solic solicitations or ideas that's just not how they work but most of the other studios do so but that's a good question i i've never done that um i, I guess would you would have to go to an agent i yeah. think an agent is probably the best way to like literally get that door open to talk to the right people um Sorry, I forgot my glass. What are the ways to set your mindset if you're assigned to a film or film genres that you may not match your own personal sp style, especially seeing that these projects last for years? Ooh, that's a really good, that's a really good question. That, that's where it becomes, that's just like, I am working for a job and getting paid well and I have health insurance. So you just, <laughs> as silly as that might sound, that's what you often have to do if, if things are really bad. I, if I had a really, really bad day, especially at a place like Pixar where it has an incredible campus and there's food and I can take walks and get coffee. I, I didn't have much to complain about. It's like, I'm not digging ditches. I'm not flipping burgers. I'm not, you know, I, I can draw and do this and sort of try to give the director what they want. The hard part at a place like Pixar is when you knew the movie was in trouble and you kind of knew that inevitably the director is probably going to get replaced. That's, a, that's like a painful year. It takes like a year for them to really make that decision. Um, that's painful. But you basically just do the job you're getting paid to do. And I, again, for me, I had married and have kids. I would just remember like, okay, I'm getting paid. I have health insurance. Like there could be worse things that I could be doing. And you just do the best job that you can do. But that, that can be harder, easier if it's been done yeah. harder. And I think but, it's important to remember when you're working on films, um, at least when I was running a team at oh, anywhere, is that yeah. it's a benevolent, I mean, it's a dictatorship. Hopefully it's a benevolent dictatorship. Yes. But it's not your movie, it's no. their movie. And if you don't like their movie, then you either need to figure out how to do something else that you like um, on the side and continue to do this or not do this because right. they're not going to immediately hand over the movie to you. No, that's not. And you probably, works. if you cause, if you're, if you're very unhappy and you have a bad attitude, they're going to take you off the phone and you don't want that. Yeah. Um, great. The next question is obviously a question that's near and dear to my heart. Are there many female storyboard artists? Uh, there are a lot more now than there ever were. Uh, th there weren't many at all when I started. There was only one, Jill Colton. Yes, Jill, she's awesome. Yeah, uh, and now she's a director. And now she's a director, she's but th that was it. Uh, but again, the back half of my time there, it's almost equal now. Um, but it took many years for that to happen. Again, I think the internship programs that they started putting together 
brought in a lot of different voices and different people. And they were they they started to pay a lot more attention to let's make sure we have as many men, women as men. And it just I saw those numbers rise quite a bit before I left. Um so do you use color in your storyboards? I would actually just say that like I do think it's still a particularly difficult department to break into for women. Um mm. because it is like where you, you know, who you know is a you know, and not a, not a lot of people know about storyboard storyboarding. So I think it can be still difficult and I think that they're making strides with you know there being more female directors and more yes. female directors often hire more female storyboarders sure. but it is important to like be tenacious if it's something that you want to do because it doesn't um it's getting better but it it's is. not like some places are better yeah. than others I have no idea what the ratio is in tv though I think yeah. it may be higher in tv that there's more women in, in t but I don't really know again this is just what I hear from friends yeah. that are in tv yeah it's 13 percent is it 13 yeah. percent okay yeah I mean, I think yeah. sometimes I heard when you see so. like more women than zero, you think that it's more. <laughs> it's all good. Because, but it's still more than. And then most of those are white women. So you know, mm. um, adding to the fact that like you know there needs to just be general because the story department has so much power and control over yeah. the, like the story. What it's interesting because my first experience, one of the first jobs I had was at Colossal Pictures, that commercial house, and there were just as many women as men, like on, in all departments. That was my first experience. So. When I went to Pixar, I was like, well, this is totally different. But I think that company just treated it differently. Yeah. Um, do you use color in your storyboards? Ooh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> okay, color is, well, especially when you're storyboarding a film like multiple times over multiple years. Color, oh my God, yeah. We, we colored our storyboards on Bugs Life and uh, it, I still, ugh, yeah, it's, it's like I got nightmares. It, it's just, it's so much work. And man, yeah, the boards may look amazing, but it's not really necessary. Uh, Bugs Life, I, I understand why we did it because we had so many characters. Uh, once we were doing cars and everything was being done with Photoshop, it was very easy to color just Lightning McQueen and Mater, you know, or maybe the other characters. But that is a terrifying Pandora's box of pain if you start coloring all your boards. Um, yeah, that's just, you know, again, if you're boarding for yourself or, you're boarding for a client where the boards have to look amazing. That's a whole different story. Um, with, uh, with being a storyboarder, have you ever run into not having enough ideas? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You may hit the wall, you know, daily or once a week or something. I try to have other things on the side, like my own drawings or maybe a short that I want to do, or even just getting up and taking a walk. Um, again, I'm always watching movies, so I'll throw a movie on and just kind of, zone out for a bit or get ideas again I like to I had heard this said by a friend he would call it drawing your way to a solution so I do a lot of thumbnailing so when I start a sequence I do it tiny I draw it small just to kind of get my ideas flowing and uh, I will eventually find what I need to find with whatever shot it is or how I want to start a scene or how I want to finish a scene but yes every artist is going to hit roadblock and it's sometimes it can be really hard to break out of it yeah um, what was the easiest storyboard you worked on? I guess maybe the easiest uh, film you were watching. Yeah, I, again, I think Finding Nemo because they were really fun and very easy to draw. So yeah, I, so when I worked on Finding Dory, I was like, this is awesome. I remember these guys, they're easy to draw, they're fun. So yes, those were, you know, but then I worked on Brave and oh my God, like, oh, drawing people is, that's a whole nother, yeah, it's very difficult. <laughs> And all that hair. There can be all that hair and it's just, it's like appendages and, but the same thing with animators. When you talk to the animators, they loved working on Nemo and Dory because they were easy to animate. But then when you get people and fingers and, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a lot more work. Yeah. Um, could you talk about your goals with your new independent freelance venture? Is it bringing you different satisfactions that Pixar work with? Yeah, I think the variety of work is awesome. I'm getting to meet different people, work different ways, learn how to work remotely, which I had never done. Uh, it forced me to build my own home office, which I really wanted to do. So now I have my own little space that I work out of. Um, yeah, it, I, I want to work on more live action. That's what I want to do. I would like, you know, like a bucket list thing would be to do a horror movie. I would love to work on a horror movie. That's, that's, a, that's a high on my list of things to do. There's certain people I want to work with. Um, you know, if I had a chance to work on a Marvel film, man, that would be awesome. Um, but I like live action. I just do. It's a little more close to what I like story-wise. So again, the movie I'm working on now is an independent feature, but I love the script and it's got some very adult themes. And so that's a little bit 
more what I'm interested in doing. Um, yeah, and I, I want to make my own short at some point. <laughs> um, did you work on Inside Out? I did not. Again, Pixar is doing like five, six movies at a time, and I just, I, what was I working on? I think I was working on Coco. And then I bounced around with some other movies like all the while in, Inside Out was happening. Uh, did any of the movies you helped storyboard give you ideas for newer movies that came along? If so, what movies inspires you for others that came along down the road? Okay, what is the question? Let me see. Um, I don't know, maybe Morgan, if you wanna, un if you're there, wanna unmute and clarify, or I don't have my <clears> glasses on. Did any of the movies that you helped storyboard give you ideas for newer movies that came along? Well, I mean, you're always inspired when you're working on the movies and they might give you an idea for something to do on your own uh, that you can sort of just like set aside and go, oh, maybe I'll tinker with that later. Um, but I'm always inspired by the movies that I'm watching. Again, I love foreign movies. I love horror movies. And so like, I'm, that's how often where I get inspiration. I get inspiration from sort of anywhere, you know, you, you never know where inspiration is going to hit. The hard part is remembering <laughs> the ideas that I will forget things. So I have to, like my office is full of index cards with just ideas pinned up on the wall. I'm like, if I don't write this down, I'm going to forget it. So that's, that's how I have to work. Um, yeah, Morgan, if that didn't answer I'm not your sure question, if I, yeah. uh, you can just unmute and get some clarification on that. Um, what's the most outlandish concept that's ever been pitched? Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the first version of Wally, when he got up into space, they were aliens in the spaceship and not people. And Wally basically incited a rebellion and it was like Spartacus in space. It was super fun and ridiculous and silly. Uh, and it did not, we ended up coming up with a different idea, which I think is a great one that like, oh my God, this, those were people. Um, I think one of the more outlandish things I ever did at Pixar was again, Coco had different versions. And one of the first versions they traveled down a river, almost like Apocalypse Now, <laughs> sort of like going deeper and deeper into the land of the dead. And they found these people that we called clay people. And so I got to look at old forensic pictures about how people would put clay over skulls of people that had died just to see what they might look like. And so these people, uh, they could not accept the fact they were dead. And so they covered themselves in clay to look like people with skin. And it was really weird. And I loved the idea, so I did all these beat boards for this idea. And they could smell the living, so when the kids in the boat came up, they smelled the kids, and so it kind of turned into a sort of like an undead, because they ran into the river and there's, the clay was falling. I mean, yeah, it was awesome, I loved it, but I knew there was no way that Pixar would do this. But I have all the beat boards, and so it was really fun to work on. Um, that was probably the most outlandish I feel like there was a lot of outlandish stuff in Cars too early on. Well, <laughs> there, were a lot of out, there were a lot of outlandish ideas that we would sort of throw out there and have on a board that were like totally inappropriate. And and uh, but you, that's how you kind of let off steam. You would just draw stuff that was like really inappropriate and then keep it or you know just stupid things. Um. Oh, and then Riley said, "I don't know about storyboarding, but I did hear that it's easier to get a writing job in TV for women than it is to get a writing job." Ooh, maybe. Movie. And I think that that's probably there's just more television being made than that yeah. movies being. Yeah. I mean, I can say that at least two or three of the interns that we had that I think were offered. Well, one worked for like a year, but she left because she knew, like, my options are very limited at a larger studio, not just Pixar. I think any larger studio. And so she left, and now she's writing on TV and doing very well for herself. So. It, it's again, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to just get up and move and go to a different city? And like, that's kind of what I did with San Francisco. I was in LA, and, but I didn't like LA. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to live in San Francisco. I'm young. I'm 22. I can do this. I'm going to do it now, not knowing what the hell I was doing, like hoping I would find work. So a lot of it is just <laughs> gambling with what you, there, obviously there's more choices in LA. So it's smarter to sort of, I think, be down there if you want to try different things. Yeah, but I, I think guess. you can make it. Or, I mean, I think guys, we're in the land of well, quarantine. I think we're all you can kind of make it work like, anywhere. What sort of. we can do anywhere. Yeah, um, I think it's harder to meet people though. Yeah. like I'm having left Pixar with 22 years of that under my belt. It was easy to sort of set up shop and yeah. work remotely here. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
You've kind of been talking about this throughout, but what is your step-by-step -step process when storyboarding? Okay, well, when I get pages, I, I read through so I can understand what's happening. I, I see if there's any screen direction, any ideas. I, you know, ideally you're getting a handoff. It's called a handoff to sit down with a director. Sometimes they draw, that's great. When, when some, someone like my brother, he draws. So we would get a, a bunch of thumbnails. It'd be like an hour, maybe like a two hour session of like really figuring out what they want. Sometimes it's just like, here, do what you're gonna do. Like come up with some ideas. Okay, then you get a lot of freedom. Uh, I will read the, the pages and then I will thumbnail. I believe firmly in, in doing small drawings and at least trying to get a version of the whole sequence up for yourself. So I look through all the shots and then I find something that I think, oh, you know what? I think this shot is a better way to start the, the sequence. So I'm not wasting a lot of time in Photoshop making stuff look pretty because that's not what it's about. It's trying to figure out the shot structure of the sequence and how those shots are going to be edited together. Uh, then I will do a rough pass either in Photoshop or I will, I have templates that are a little bit bigger. Uh, again, this is how I worked on the movie that I'm working on now. And then I scan those in and then I pitch. I pitch remotely to the guy in New York City. And it worked great. He's happy to see it and he understands what the drawings are. They don't have to be pretty, but as long as he knows where the camera is and how the shots are being edited, that's the most important thing. So that's how I like to work in the beginning. And then we'll go digital do all the notes and then we hand them in and they get edited. It's, it's sort of a condensed version of, but again, I like to work on paper not a lot of people do, but I don't like to be tethered by the computer. I like to, if I can go to Starbucks or, you know, and sit down and that's sometimes what I would do. Kaki, did you have a question? Do you want to unmute and ask your question? You raised your hand. Who am I? Oh. oh, but you have to unmute. Oh wait, do I have to unmute you? Hold on. Sorry, getting used to this <clears throat> new system. Ah, you should be able to speak. I don't know. I can't hear you. Hmm. No, we can't hear you. So, sorry, for whatever reason, it says you're unmuted, but yeah, oh. we can't hear you. Could she type in her? Yeah, can you? <clears throat> um, okay. Is the question the beat board, how is that different than a storyboard? Is that your question? How is a beat board okay. different than a storyboard? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So beat boards, again, early on in the years of Pixar, we wouldn't work from fully written scripts. We might have a, an outline. And so in order to sell the idea to the powers that be that, like, do we want to move forward and get a story team together and start storyboarding this movie, we would do what's called beat boards. So it's just basically, it might be one image that sort of tells you what's happening in the entire sequence or just a scene. and so we might create something like 60 or 70 beat boards for a whole movie. They don't do a lot of that anymore because they, they really focus on doing scripts. But I like beat boards because you get to spend a little bit more time on the drawing. And it's kind of like a comic book page. Like how much information can I squeeze into this image and make it cinematic and interesting um, to sell the idea of this scene or, or beat or moment. Uh, so that's what a beat board is. And then Sometimes you will keep those up. Yeah, one of the cool things too is that you can pin them all up and then it sort of, it's like the whole movie on a board, you know, basically just in visual format. Um, what was one of your favorite movies to storyboard? Uh, again, I think Wally. -E. I really liked science fiction. I liked working with my brother and again, finding Nemo. I also really liked Coco. I hadn't worked with uh, Lee, Lee Unkridge, who was an editor for a long time. He directed Toy Story 3 and so Coco was his second Feature. I really liked working with him a lot. And I liked the writer, Matt Aldridge. Also, they worked really, really, really well together. So there was a lot of a lot of more brainstorming and discussions as a story team on that movie. Um, I did not like storyboarding <laughs> that movie, but I liked the story development part. But I, again, I loved Finding Dory just because I liked Ryan his characters. Um, Brave was really fun. I liked working with Brenda and story. Might be a shorter to say what you didn't like. What I didn't like. Yeah. I don't think there's anything you didn't like. Yeah, I mean I I like them all. It's again, there's just you might love the idea, but then drawing people is just hard. So it's just it's tricky depending yeah. on what the project is. Yeah. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask question and then you can finish up with any sort of final notes. Yeah. Does anybody have any last questions? Any questions? What are your um, sort of like, what would your suggestions be for folks who are 
love drawing and love yeah. movie watching and I think keep up with the drawing and then study study film. I also think getting out of your comfort zone. And by, by that I mean doing things you haven't done, whether it's photography or painting, but also even movie watching. Um, I, I can tell you, I did not want to watch silent movies, was not my thing, or uh, musicals. I didn't love musicals. So when I was at Pixar, this, this lovely list, this amazing list, the, the AFI top 100 movies of all time basically came out. And I had seen about 40 of the movies. So it took me about two or three years to watch all other, the other 60 or so, because I screen one every week in one of our screening rooms. And so it forced me to watch movies that I normally wouldn't see. And sure enough, there were several on that list that I was like, why have I not seen this movie? It's amazing. Why have I not seen this musical? But every movie is going to feed your brain with what it takes to make a film. I see Stephanie Cole. <laughs> um, uh, it's crazy seeing the films that you've worked on be so successful that you see it everywhere. Have you ever been to the parks? Is it surreal seeing the films as rides? And do you think they portrayed the film the right correctly? Yeah, it's weird. I can tell you one of the weirdest things was going to Disneyland and going to Haunted Mansion during Halloween because they completely changed it to Nightmare Before Christmas. That was mind blowing. I, I could not believe that they had done the whole thing based on this, this movie I had worked on over 20 years ago. Uh, the other thing was that Lamplight Lounge, right? Remember mm -hmm. in California Adventure, it's all decked out in Pixar stuff and there's like drawings from my friends. Actually, I saw some of my drawings in this weird chandelier thing. I saw, I, it was bizarre. Yeah, it's really, it's weird. Uh, but it's kind of exciting that people, that so many people are interested. I love the, the fact that what I work on has like this shelf life that's gonna last forever. People are gonna watch these movies for as long as I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I love that idea that I've been part of films that people love and they're sold their kids or or that kids grew up on these films that I worked on when I was much younger. Um, just like the movies that I saw when I was a kid. Yeah, and to hijack that conversation, why I think it's important that there's diversity in who makes our movies is because they stand the test of time. <laughs> yes. And so it's really important that we don't always have the same type of person making movies because Absolutely. All of them, you don't see any difference in the movie. Yeah, and so for us, it's been fun to show our kids different films, like, like for example, the Cartoon Saloon. Yeah who has made marvelous movies and all of them would never be made here in yeah. the States. Or the Miyazaki films. The Miyazaki where movies, always again. have like a strange quirky female hair. Yes, but a different voice from a different country is so important to take a look at. They can even be different voices from this country. Yes, <laughs> a little bit, but it's, it's, it's harder for them to yeah. break through, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Miriam, what about writers? Their way forward in films? Yeah, I mean, it depends on, I think, having an agent. I think having yeah. a script. I know there, there are people in development, and their job is to just read scripts. They get all these scripts, and then they read them, not to make the movie, but to look for a writer to pair up with whatever director in development needs a writer. So I know that that's a, certainly a really good pathway. How they get those scripts, I don't really know. Yeah. I'm assuming it's through agents and whatnot. And, um, but every writer I worked with, it was a script that somebody in development had read or it was a movie they had seen they had already written. Um, but I think there's yeah. so many alternative paths now um, right. because with the advent of YouTube and all of this like independent distribution channels, I think the best way is <clears> to like <throat> write and direct your own stuff and get Absolutely. it out there and then find out if you have an audience. I mean, yeah. you don't, I mean, Brenda Chapman, who is a close friend of ours, who, you know, is the director, the very first female animation director when she directed Prince of Egypt and the first woman to ever win an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, you know, always talks about how she had to break into a studio system. You guys don't have to if you yes. don't want to. I also recommend if you can work for a smaller place, do it yeah. because you're going to be able to do more Absolutely. And, and get to, I think, spread your wings a bit and try even different things that you probably normally wouldn't get to do in a larger studio. You're yeah. going to be pretty much doing what you're paid to do. Yeah. I mean, I think both Nate and I started in smaller studios yes. and you got to do a lot more yeah, because they were just like, yeah, you want to help? Great. Sure. You know, once you got to Pixar, it was like, this is what we hired you for. Yeah. Which is fine because <laughs> I wanted to make movies, but the smaller places I got to do layouts some character design, some animation, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, oh, and then I hope your short will be a horror musical. Oh, yeah, I do love horror, <laughs> and I like the horror musical idea for sure, yeah. 